Hi everybody, my name is Pat Hogarty and I'm a professor of real estate here at Sacramento City College. And what this is is a series of guest lectures that we're going to be having to the campus that are going to be discussing specific things that have to do with real estate. In this particular case, we're going to be covering today real estate contracts. And this is actually going to be a four-part series. So the first part that we're going to be doing is covering uh, the residential listing agreement. We're going to be talking about that. Then, the, uh, then as we go on, the next video that we'll be doing, or the next lecture that we'll be doing, we'll be talking about the, uh, what we call the residential purchase agreement. Then the uh, third lecture is going to be about what we call uh, uh, arbitration, mediation, and negotiations. In other words, what does one do if they have a problem in a real estate transaction? And then the last thing we're going to be doing is talking about the role of the Sacramento Association of Realtors, which is a professional realtor organization here in Sacramento, and what they do to help resolve disputes between clients and between realtors and uh, how their process actually works. And what I'd like to do is welcome Dave Tanner. And Dave is the Chief Executive Officer of the Sacramento Association of Realtors. And Dave has been in real estate for about, since 1978. That's correct. And, and uh, he uh, actually became an attorney, if you will, graduated from law school in 1981. And he graduated from Santa Clara uh, law, uh, School of Law in Santa Clara, California. And just to give you a little bit of an idea about the uh, Sacramento Association, it roughly has somewhere over about 5,000 realtor members. Close to 5,500 now. Close to 5,500 now. And I believe the last time I checked, I know that you have over 400 affiliate members, which I know you'll correct me on, on uh, That's the about number right. of people that we have. Um, one of the things, the reason why I asked Dave to come in is because he has been involved in, uh, if you will, what we call the Member Professional Standards Committee. And this committee is responsible for uh, working with when clients have disputes. So he has years and years of expertise and also has years of experience working as both a realtor and an attorney. And one of the things, the other, a couple of things that I want to add to this that the reason why I thought Dave was really important is all the contracts that we talk about in real estate that an agent has to complete, Dave is the one that teaches the agents how to fill these contracts out. And he teaches in a program called a Ready Program, which is a program that helps brand new agents learn how what this process is like and what they should do and shouldn't do. And he's also for years taught uh, uh, just classes in all different facets of real estate. And I want to thank you very much, Dave, for coming today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this. My pleasure to be here. Okay. And what I would like to do is start off by talking about you know, when we talk about the, a real estate transaction, we typically are going to approach it whereas an agent is either going to be listing a home for sale or they're going to be helping a buyer find a house. So we've got to start someplace, so I thought we would start on the listing side. And so what I'd like to have you do t is t let's talk a little bit about the uh, residential listing agreement. And the one we're going to be talking about, by the way, is where the agent has what we call the exclusive right to sell. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, too. Right. There's, uh, there's uh, several types of listings. The one that we use most commonly, particularly with residential property, is the exclusive right to sell. And that means that once they have signed uh, a contract with the broker, if that house sells, regardless of how it sells during the contract period, that broker is going to get paid. Additionally, there's an exclusive agency contract where uh, if a broker brings in the buyer for the property, the listing broker is going to get paid, but the seller has the ability to sell it themselves and not pay the broker. And then the other is an open listing uh, where they sign a contract and if that broker produces the buyer, they get paid. If some other broker produces the buyer, they don't get paid. You rarely see those in residential, but you see them very common in commercial. You drive down the street with large vacant properties, and you'll see three or four broker signs up there. Each of those brokers probably has an open listing. Whichever one of them you call to write the contract gets paid. The rest of them just get to come and take their sign down and go away. So, 
Those now, are the different types of listings we have in California. Now, when you mentioned exclusive right to sell, essentially, um, are, are we saying the fact that uh, if, my, if, for example, if I list my house with you and my uh, brother calls me up and says, listen, I really want to buy your house, um, does that mean that you still get paid? Under the exclusive right to sell, I would have a right to get paid. Now, in that situation, I might be willing to negotiate something with you uh, to have you be able to sell it to your brother. But, yes, that means that under the terms of the contract, I'm entitled to get paid. And I, I would think that the, the advantage to that is because of the fact that as a real estate agent, when you list the property for sale, you're going to be putting an awful lot of time and effort and money on your own part in listing the property for sale. And you really don't want to do all of that only to find out that somebody else is going to you know, you have it listed for 30 days and you've put all this advertising and everything else out only to find out that somebody has turned around and, you know, sells the house for money. That's correct, because as real estate professionals, uh, we don't have something that we sell. You know, we don't sell TVs or cars or anything. Basically, all that we have to sell is our time and our expertise. And so we can't give away our time and expertise. So once we've done the work, we should be entitled to get paid. And that's why we have the listing agreement to ensure that that happens. Under what circumstance, uh, you mentioned the fact that, you know, you know that, that that would be the best one. And then you said there was more or less the second listing where they, where if the broker finds it, but if somebody else, not the open listing, it was the second one. You said, what was the second the exclusive one? agency. And again, what, what are we talking about there? What that is, the exclusive agency listing says that uh, I list your property and I put it on the multiple listing service and I put a sign in the front yard and another broker drives down the street and they see the property, they look on the MLS and they see the property mm -hmm. and they decide that their buyer would like to buy that property and they show it to them. And the buyer writes an offer because it's an agency bringing in the offer, both brokers are going to get paid. Okay. under the agreement. But if the seller goes to work and the guy working in the cubicle next to him says, you know, I'd really like to buy your house, they can work out a deal between the two of them and the listing broker doesn't get paid anything. Doesn't get paid anything. So that is why you rarely find exclusive agencies being used in residential property because the listing broker has already done all the work okay. and uh, then they have the ability. For instance, uh, as I mentioned, you put the property on MLS, you put a sign in the front yard. If somebody drives down the street and sees that sign and they go up and knock on the door, the buyer and seller could work out a deal directly and the broker in that case would not get paid if it was an exclusive agency listing. So uh, as a real estate professional, you would rarely want to use an exclusive agency listing. Now, is there, uh, is there times when, um, you know, like our market is the real estate market changes all the time, you know, right now, from talking to the fellow realtors in the association, they're finding that there's a big shortage of inventory, at least right now when we're talking about 2012, which in years to come, it could be completely changed. But do we find that there's, that does the market itself drive what type of listing becomes popular? In other words, do they go up and down where there's more exclusive right to sell versus the other one, or, or how does that work? Generally, no, although there, there can be some influence that way. But generally, uh, for the 30 years that I've been in the business, the exclusive right to sell is the one that's most commonly used, probably in excess of 98% of residential listings are exclusive right to sell. Okay. Because of all the work that you do in marketing the property, you want to make sure that on the backside you're going to get paid. Okay. Now, what are some of the things when the agent, you know, the agent's out there, and I, like I tell my students, you know, when you got into real estate, you, you may or may not have realized that you're going to be the one that's going to be working on originating these contracts with the client and also explaining them to the client. So based on all of your experience and complaints you've heard and everything else, what are some of the areas that, let's say an agent doesn't fraudulently do it, but they, get, they miss something that gets themselves say, causes some problems or misunderstandings between the buyer and seller. What are some of those key things that they need to look out for to make sure that are in the contract? Well, when I teach the class on listing agreements to, uh, to licensees, what I tell them that is that uh, the, the residential listing agreement currently is a four-page form. When I got into the business 30 years ago, it was a one-page form. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
most of the three pages that have been added now are disclosures protecting the buyer or the seller or the brokers from potential for litigation later on. Probably the greatest thing that a real estate professional can do is make sure when they're listing the property that they go through the listing agreement paragraph by paragraph because there's all the items in there that are disclosure items, that are representation items, and you want to make sure that you talk about all of those with the seller because there may be problems that the seller doesn't think of telling you or they might not want to tell you uh, that you really need to know in, to, in order to represent them uh, accurately or professionally. For instance, uh, in the state of California, if there is a notice of default filed against the property, a special purchase agreement has to be used if an investor is buying that property and if the property is currently owner-occupied. Now, when you say, uh, not to interrupt you, but when you say notice of default, okay, what, what do we mean by that? What, what does notice of default mean? Well, a notice of default is the first step that a lender takes in foreclosing on the property. If a lender wants to foreclose, they file a notice of default, and then they file a notice of sale, and then the actual sale occurs. Okay. And so the legislature in California has decided that if a notice of default has been filed against the property, the owner of that property is essentially under more duress than they might otherwise be. It kind of changes their negotiating stance a little bit. They want, they want to kind of get out of the house, more or less. Well, and they're, they're very concerned. They think they're going to lose the house. Right. So they might be willing to give it away. Right. And historically, what happened is that uh, some people would come in and say, I'll give you $1,000 for your house when there was $50,000 in equity in it. Oh, okay. And people would sign it over. So the legislature passed laws to protect them. But one of those laws says that if there is a notice of default pending, a special purchase agreement has to be used that gives the seller a right to cancel for five days after they enter into a contract to sell the property. So a listing broker has to know that right up front. Okay. But the seller might not on their own volunteer to tell you that. Right. And if you're not following through the contract and all the steps, you might not ask them. And you take the listing and you get in the contract and then you find out that uh, you haven't used the right purchase agreement, then they have to cancel everything and start all over again. So it's very important to go through paragraph by paragraph and ask all the questions. So this, this, this separate purchase agreement for that, and I'm sure that we've had a lot of that kind of issues going on, you know, when, you know, because I know I've even had people, I don't sell real estate, but, you know, because I have too much time just <laughs> teaching classes. But um, I know I've had people ask me because they're in a foreclosure what they should do, and usually the standard answer is, you know, you need to work with your bank or whatever. But... I, I guess, is the actual form itself look different? Is there kind of like words on the form? In other words, if I get down to a certain item and it says, the person says, oh, yeah, I have a foreclosure notice. It was posted on my house yesterday. Here it is. Then I need to what, probably take that agreement that I've been starting to fill out and put that aside and have another agreement, or is this an addendum to that agreement, or what? what? Uh, it's an entirely separate agreement. Okay. Uh, because the legislature, for some reason in their wisdom, decided that uh, if there's a notice default pending, the contract has to be in 10-point type, 10-point okay. uh, font. Mm -hmm. And the standard contract we use is an 8-point font. So one of the things is that if there's a notice of default, they have to use a special contract. It is essentially all the same terms until you get to the part about the right to cancel. It's all the same terms, but it's 10 pages just because it's printed in larger font. Oh, okay, okay. So another thing that I'm getting from what you're saying is the fact that as, as an agent, when I'm sitting there, is that I need to go over this with the client, but I actually need to use the contract if I start on page one, almost like a checklist to make sure that I'm covering, you know, in other words, I need to look at the paragraph. I know, would hopefully know what the paragraph means if I'm a, an agent, but I need to go over that or paraphrase that with a client or let them read it and almost like check it off. In other words, okay, we're good here. We're clear here. We can now move to the next step, the next step, and the next step. Is that correct? That's correct because, uh, for instance, on the top of page two of the uh, current uh, residential listing agreement is where the seller represents that they are the only owners of the property. Right. And that's a question you want to make sure you ask. Uh, because I've seen people get in trouble sometimes where not so much these days, but back uh, several years ago, 
we used to end up in the situation where parents would co-sign for the property and then everybody forgot all about it because the parents didn't intend to be owners of the property, but they were on title when they co-signed. Right. So then the husband and wife that are living in the property come in and ask you to take the listing. And if you take the listing without checking, you end up when you get ready to close escrow with two people that haven't signed any of the contracts that are owners of the property. And then you have to go back and catch up on all the paperwork and everything. So you need to ask those questions at the time you take the listing. So if there's going to be problems, you have time to work on them rather than having to be at the last minute when escrow is ready to close and then something comes up. Okay. What do you do in a case where, uh, which I think is a fairly common thing, that may, not, not common every day, but may very well happen, where the house is actually originally bought by a husband and wife. They both were bought the house when they were, I don't know, 30 years old or 40 years old. They were both healthy and then... They've owned the house for 30 years, and one of them passes away. Say the husband passes away. Um, and uh, now all of a sudden the wife is left, and she's lived in the house for a couple of years and figures that she really, the house is too big. She needs to sell it. She wants to buy a condo. And you go out there and get to that point. How do you, how do you even go about discovering whether, you know, if she's, uh, could she sign for herself or does we need to do something to change something on the title or what, what do we need to do there? It's going to depend on how they held title. Uh, if they held title as uh, joint tenants or as uh, community property with right of survivorship, which is a concept that only exists in California. Okay. Uh, but if you hold title in either of those ways, all you have to do is record an affidavit of the death of the other spouse, and the remaining spouse then owns the property uh, separate of any interest. But if they held property as tenants in common, they're probably going to have to go through the probate process in order to clear up the title and remove the deceased name from the title. Which means if they had a will or died in test eight, in other words, without a will, no matter what, if they had it in tenants in common, they'd have to go through. Either way, they're probably going to have to go through now because if they were spouses rather than two unrelated persons, uh, but if they were spouses and jointly on there, there are some expedited ways of dealing with that through probate, assuming that that's all that they had to, to deal with. So let's say, for example, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, let's say the person passed away a couple of years ago, and I, I don't know how one would go about doing it, but let's say there was never an affidavit of death. And in other words, when this, where does this document come from? Who prepares it? How does it get recorded? You know, you know, how do you, do you need to have a copy of this document before you can sign them up, or how does that work? Well, generally, what I advise uh, uh, people to do is before you take a listing. You contact the title company, the escrow company that you work with, and ask them to give you what's called a property profile. Okay. And part of that property profile, they will give you a copy of the last deed on the property. Okay. So you can look at the last deed and see whose names are on there. Okay. And if those are not the people you're talking to, then you've got to figure out why those are not the people that you're talking to. So... The title, is this something, this property profile, this is something that you would, you would essentially order before you would ever go out to see the clients, assuming that you didn't know who the people were. I mean, they called you up on the phone and said, can you come out and help me sell the house? You would get the property profile before you actually went out for the listing then, right? That's what I always recommend because that's the only way that you can know for sure. Because even if somebody that you've known for 15 years, you might not know that somebody had co-signed for them originally and they're still on title. Okay. To go back to your uh, earlier question about somebody that died, I had one recently where the person had passed away 15 years ago. Oh. And nobody had ever done anything about removing the name of the uh, remaining or the uh, deceased joint tenant. That can be done at any time. All they have to do is get a copy of the certificate of death. And that comes from who? The county? comes from the county where the individuals... And that would be the coroner's office would supply that? or I think it goes from the recorder's office, but I'm not sure because okay. I, don't, I don't deal with that part okay. of it. Um, but then you would just prepare the affidavit. And usually if you're selling the property, the escrow company will prepare that affidavit for the uh, remaining joint tenant to sign as part of the escrow process. Okay. Their name doesn't have to be removed until part of the closing process, 
as long as you know that they're not going to be on title when you close so they don't have to sign the documents. Okay, but that process needs to be started. You need to be aware of it and get that whole process started because that could be something fairly simple to do or it could be more, a little bit more. Sometimes they get complicated, so you Sometimes. need to do them as early as possible. <laughs> okay. Now, the other thing I was going to ask you about is in, in the listing agreement, you know, there, there's, there's some things in here, um, you know, that in the first page, you know, that we talk about that you have to fill in, like the property address, the location of the property, and, you know, the commission amount you're going to get paid. And, and one of the things that, uh, you know, I'd like to do, uh, know is, is there a certain, um, do you recommend, you know, we always talk about whether we're, it's a percentage commission or it's a net sales commission or whatever. Is there, a, is there a standard that we should work to, like all transaction, we should be using a percentage of the sales price, or how, do, how does that work? The far more common uh, way of paying uh, brokers is to pay a percentage of the sale price. Okay. Because then the amount of money fluctuates depending upon whether the sales price is higher or lower than the list price. Okay. Uh, and so that seems like probably the most fair way to do it, and it's the most common. But there's nothing wrong with doing a flat fee. Okay. And sometimes, uh, particularly in properties like um, mobile homes that tend to sell for a much lower price, a lot of times there's a flat fee there rather than the percentage because the percentage is maybe less than what the broker is willing to to do all the work for. So you're talking about a mobile home that maybe is going to sell for forty or fifty thousand dollars. You know, if you did a percentage of that, it wouldn't work out to a lot. So you may charge, but you still have to put a heck of a lot of work in to sell it. Yes, the percentage in that case might not be enough to cover your costs of doing the <laughs> transaction. Your gas to drive out there. Another thing that I noticed on the uh, on the residential listing agreement is an area where I'm supposed to be putting on there uh, identifying things that are going to stay with the property and things that are going to I'm going to take with me. So, what's been your experience with that? Why would we want to fill that out? Well, I think it's really important because in the listing agreement, the seller is signing saying that uh, this goes with the property, this does not go with the property. Uh, I think that that's very important because if you, as the listing broker, uh, you talk with the seller and you say, well, the storage shed in the backyard or the, the uh, freestanding spa, which is personal property, unless it's built in. Mm -hmm. But if it's one of those you just plug into an outlet, that's personal property. That's not going to be included in the, in the sale of real property unless you say that it is. If the listing broker talks with the seller and says that uh, the spa is, uh, is going to be included and then the listing broker on all their marketing materials and on the MLS say that spa included mm -hmm. but it's not in the listing agreement and then the contract comes in, if the, con if the price is low the seller may say, well I never told you the spa was included in the sale. And okay. then you end up with a dispute. So the best thing is to list everything that's going to be included, have the seller sign it. That does not mean that it has to be, it has to go with the sale. Because what's included in the sale or not included is still a matter of negotiation between the buyer and seller. Okay. But you want to have your start point be something that you and the seller have agreed to. And the only way that you can make sure that they've agreed to it is if they do it in writing. So, for example, if I have a chandelier in the house that was for my grandmother or I have some special drapes that for some unknown reason I paid a gazillion dollars for and I want to take those with me, I need to, I need to, put, that, I need to put that in the agreement that, that's, that, that I'm taking that with me, right? Those are the two examples that I use in the class that I teach okay. on that. And what I say is that if the seller tells you that they want to take uh, the chandelier that was a wedding gift from Aunt Mary, mm -hmm. Take Aunt Mary's chandelier down before the buyer sees the property. Okay. Because if the buyer sees the chandelier, they're going to want it. Okay. The seller says, well, the property doesn't look as good without the chandelier. Well, that is exactly why the buyer is going to be upset if you take the chandelier later. Okay. Even if you hang a sign on it that says not included in the sale, the buyer is probably going to ask for it. Okay. And then you're going to have to negotiate it. So the best thing is to have it gone. The other thing is if you go to Home Depot, and you buy one of those glass globes with two lights in it, mm -hmm. and you can replace this crystal chandelier with that glass globe, the buyer is probably not going to be happy when they come back through their walkthrough. Okay. Because even if they agreed the chandelier didn't stay, they probably didn't agree that they were going to get two bulbs and a globe on the ceiling. So okay. 
the best thing is not let the buyer see something that they're not going to be able to get. So what you're really saying there too is, is that part of listing the house for sale or part of the thing is telling the client all the things that they necessarily need to do to the house. I mean sometimes we refer to that as staging a house, you know, getting it prepared to sell, but really telling them that, you know, like if the drapes are going to go, maybe we need to take them down or the chandelier needs to come down or actually, I guess when we use the term staging, it means getting the house ready to sell. So it looks its best, but also what, what the buyer is realistically going to get then. That's correct. When I would go out to list a house, I would walk through the house with the seller. And one of the things that I would do would be to note uh, areas where I think that they might want to do touch-up painting uh, to get uh, extra furniture out of the house so it doesn't appear cluttered. There's a lot of things that a seller can do at almost no cost mm -hmm. to prepare the house for sale. And the time to do that is before you take the listing. Because if you go through the house and you start telling the seller, well, this is what I, I think you ought to do this uh, touch-up paint here. I think you ought to take these uh, excess items of furniture and put them in storage. And if the seller says they're not willing to do that, you might question whether you want to take that listing or not. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you could say there are times that if, if you know, w with a listing, if, if the owner is not necessarily going to cooperate and do some of the things, maybe the best thing to do is for them to find another agent. The, the contract uh, and the law in California says that if you take that listing, you must use your best efforts to try and sell that property. Right. And if you have a seller that is not going to produce their best efforts to try and sell the property, you probably should not be wasting your time trying to market a property for a seller that's not that motivated. Okay. And that's the thing to find out before you take the listing. Okay. Once you take a listing agreement, then you have a fiduciary duty to the seller. Okay. And if you want to get out of the contract, then the two of you have to agree to cancel the contract. Okay. But prior to the time you take the listing, you can decline to work with any client that you want to. So that's the time to figure out this is not a person I want to list the property with. So if I've been doing my timing right, we have about another um, 45 seconds or so to go. And uh, uh, I just want to ask you one more question. Hopefully you can do it as, sum it up as quickly as possible. A student in my class asked me the other day, what happens if the seller wants to cross something out on the contract? In other words, part of the printed agreement, what would you recommend that they do? What I would recommend that anybody do if somebody wants to cross out part of the contract is advise them to talk with their attorney before they do that. There's two issues. One is that almost everything in the contract has some legal s significance. That's why it's there. The other thing is that if you present a contract to another party in the transaction and something's crossed out, they're going to start wondering why. Okay. Are you trying to hide something or why? So I would recommend they talk to their attorney before they modify any standard form contract. Okay, Dave, I want to thank you very much for coming. And thank we'll you. And we'll see you in the next show. It's Bye -bye. a pleasure to be here. Bye.